what is the one single description that best tells us who you are? Hmm. I would say that I am someone who's very committed to making a mark and oh. being significant in one way or another to this world. So how do you go about doing that? Well, currently I'm going about doing that through the Leading Ladies Network. It's a women's leadership development organization. We work predominantly with high school and university level women. We provide training and polishing okay. and our focus is on helping women understand the unwritten rules when it comes to advancement in any field business in politics in career uh, so we do a lot of uh, career guidance mm. we train women who are interested in politics we do a lot focused on public speaking because these are all the aspects and skills that need to be developed for women to be effective as leaders so I, it's based on the simple conviction that women can and should lead and for young ambitious African women mm. who aspire for a life that in, involves more than just wife and motherhood they need to be supported and that's what the network seeks to do so what is it that got you to be involved or interested in this area of activity I think it's a number of things um, if I had to start I would point to my childhood. Mm. Um, I, it's difficult for me to, to kind of quantify my background. It's multicultural mm. and uh, I was born to Ghanaian parents okay. while they were in Lome, Togo. Mm. Uh, my formative years were in the U.S. Okay. Not really by choice but All because right. of the political situation of the country mm. at the time. That's where I learned to speak English. That's where I started school. And it was an environment where I was never questioned. My abilities were never questioned based right. on my gender. And um, right. then later in life, we moved back to Ghana. And immediately, I noticed a, a, a quite a disparity between you know, the expectations of, of me as a young woman growing up here and the situation we had when we were abroad. Mm. So it, you know, it prompted me to kind of explore mm. the issues of women, the issues of uh, empowerment. I know it has, it has become a very cliche word right. and to a certain extent has lost its meaning. So um, then coupled with, you know, spending a few you know, critical years of my life without a mother figure and the, the, the influence that that had on me to even seek more um, about women and, and why some, some of the challenges that we face exist. So it culminated into this desire to look closely at leadership, um, partly because at the time I was entering into university. I was mm -hmm. grappling with the questions of what I want to do with my life okay. and um, I, I, I noticed quite quickly that I, I had this natural inclination to try stuff, to do things, and I was often not the, the average girly girl. I was involved in sports and mm. doing things that guys gen generally like to do. So it, it did make me clash a lot with, with, uh, with my more traditional uh, minded peers and friends and family, but it did also prompt me to look at how we could expand the, the possibilities and really fill the leadership pipeline with women who can lead. I am of the school of thought that we as women, um, we have the ability, I think that for any woman who's a mother, for instance, who can broker peace between two warring children, mm -hmm. I believe that that's the same principle that applies to brokering peace at the UN. So I believe that we, we have the basics, but we do need the, the, the exposure, one, but we also need to learn the, the skills the polishing of those skills and so I sought to, to, to develop something that would really answer that for young women who grew up in this space. You've given me enough material for 10 questions but I'll hold on with those questions and I also realize that you enjoy reading. I do. What's the best single book you've read? Oh that is a very difficult question. I, I think my all-time favorite book is by an author called Willard Tate mm. and the name of the book is Habits of a Loving Heart. Okay. I love that book and I've read it many times and it's, it really sums up the kind of person I want to be. 
So I use it as a, as a measuring stick of sorts to determine whether or not I'm, I'm of the character um, that, that I, I believe reflects my faith and reflects the principles that I believe in. So that would be my favorite book. What's the, what's the theme of that book? Well, the theme of the book, um, I'm a Christian, and right. in, in the Christian faith, the heart plays a very central role. And, you know, there's a word of scripture that discusses um, guarding our hearts with mm -hmm. diligence because out of our hearts flow issues of life. And so the author looks at the heart and looks at the heart of a leader and looks at what are the things that you need to do, what kind of motive you need to have in mm -hmm. dealing with people to be most effective. Okay. And so it's, it's something that I, I try to, to align myself with to, in, in my relationships with people. Great. How many books do you read a year? How many books do I read a year? I would say every month I read a book. So a minimum of 12, 12 books a year, sometimes more. What are you reading now? Right now, I'm reading a book by uh, John Eldridge. Okay. It's called Hearing from God. Okay. And um, it's a Christian book, obviously, from that time. It is a Christian book. And I, I would, would hate for you to think that that's all I read. Mm -hmm. um, just before that, I was reading The 360 Leader by John C. Maxwell. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Let me take you back a bit. You spoke about uh, pol the political situation which was the reason why you were not born in, uh, in Ghana or that you did not grow up in Ghana. Mm. You mentioned Lome Togo and then you mentioned the United States of America. What, what, what were your parents doing in, in Togo? Well, my father was a member of the Hila Liman government okay. that was toppled by the military coup and uh, it was not safe for us to remain in Ghana. So that's 1979? So it was... 1981, because it was in, it, Liman came to power in 79, won the election, mm -hmm. and was toppled in 1981 mm -hmm. by the, um, okay, so, so that's clear, by, by the PNDC. Mm -hmm. So in 81, early 80s, you had to leave Ghana. Mm -hmm. And what, what was your father's role in the government? Um, I am not entirely sure. Oh, wow. He, um, yeah, he had a role in Hilali Man's uh, government, mm. but I'm not entirely sure. And what was his, what's his name? Is he alive? He is uh, passed away okay. in 2003. Oh, okay. And um, perhaps one or two people like to be reminded, the senior <laughs> generation of our viewers. My, my father's <laughs> name was Francis Osebre. Francis Osebre? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't bear your father's name? I am married now, so okay. I, I bear a different last name. All right. So you are now Mrs. Yawa. Hansen Kwao, Francis Sebre. So he was in the government, you had to leave. So really, it was Togo en route to the United States of America. Well, we were relocated as political refugees. Ooh. So uh, that's why the issue of uh, not really by choice, but mm. really, um, and we were uh, taken to the US as political refugees. And we lived there until it was safe enough to return to Ghana. So we returned to Ghana in 1996, and uh, I have lived here full time since then. How, uh, what do you remember of it, going to, how long did it stay in Togo for, you said? Um, I think we were there for about eight years. About eight oh, years in yes. Togo, do you speak French? Um, po. <laughs> I see, so, and how old or how young were you at that time? What, what do you time, remember of it? You know, I, I was really young. Um, I remember it very vaguely. I do remember changing locations quite often. Mm. I do remember uh, strange people hosting us in different mm. places and always being on the move. Mm. Um, but it's, it's a chapter of my life I, I, I don't particularly enjoy going back to, so. What's the name from? Well, my name, uh, I was named by my grand uncle, mm. and uh, I understand that it means I'm Thursday born. Okay, from which part of Ghana? Well, my mother, both of my parents hail from the Volta region. My father was a Guan, and my mother is an Ewe, okay. and uh, some of the family mm. uh, are, fall in that catchment area okay. that borders uh, the Ghana-Togo border. So it's very common on the Togo side, my name. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of the form of ya okay. that Santis use. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Let's move away from Togo, which you don't like to uh, talk about <laughs> too much because probably it doesn't bring you the best of memories. But then you moved on to the United States of America. Um, how old were you about that time? Uh, I was in elementary school at the time, mm -hmm. so. In your mid-teens? Or early? Early. 
early teens. And then, so where did you go in the U.S.? Well, we lived in California, and uh, at the time, uh, we, my father enrolled in a biblical se seminary. And so he studied there for a few years, and we later moved to Alabama. Uh, which is down south, a yeah. very different environment. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we he you studied. College people, so to speak, in Alabama. <laughs> well, or it depends on which part. Which part? Because <laughs> Alabama features prominently in, in, in civil rights movements exactly, and black history exactly. and, and all of that. And at the time we lived there, there were still spillovers of that. So it, it was an interesting experience, to say the least. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, California, very different, as you say. Mm -hmm. How different? Well, I think that um, in terms of development, I think if you ask the average American, they will tell you that South is not as developed as, as, as the coastal, as either coast of the U.S. So I think different in that sense. Particularly the West. Mm -hmm. Particularly the West Coast where the California is. The West Coast is. where California is. Mm -hmm. And so people are different as well. I think people are more friendly down South. So it has its pros and cons. Okay. Uh, and you're talking about the 80s here. Uh, um, is it the California in the 1980s was still that developed? Well, we lived in Fresno, which was a very strong, it had a really good mix of, uh, of Africans, of Hispanics, of, of locals, of course, and different people from different places. So it was a true melting pot of sorts. And so I thought it was a, a really interesting multicultural environment to grow up in. What did you learn in those years? in California particularly before we move to down south to Alabama? I think in those years, now mind you, we have left our home continent. We are living in an environment where, which is new to us, we are struggling with English. Mm. And um, you know, our names sound very different, our accents sound very different. And uh, so it was a struggle to it be truthful. Like mine sound now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you be the judge of that. So, so yes, there, there, there was a lot of struggle as we sought to perfect our English mm -hmm. to help us with school, to get ahead. And, um, you, know, we, we, you know, in school we were just those kids with the weird names, okay. you know, and our parents with the weird accents and, you know, we, we were outliers. And how and many kids were you? I have, uh, there are six of us in all, so I have four brothers and I have a sister as well. You were all together with your parents We were all time. together. We so, were all together. So that was, how did you manage to get to the U.S.? That, uh, was it out of your own industry, so to speak, or because you were political um, asylum seekers in Togo or whatever? That was the channel by which you went. Well, I would say beyond all of that, it was the grace of God. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, like I said, there was a lot of movement uh, when uh, the family was in Togo and there was a lot of instability. But uh, I think that through a series of very fortunate events, uh, we, were, we were connected through the UNHCR, the High Commission for Refugees, and our case was examined and, and uh, they, they, they sought asylum for, for our family. And, um, so you said you moved back in '96. Uh, mm -hmm. what, so did you attend school in California as well? Yeah, you were in there we for did. Long? You were there for yeah, long? Yeah, we, we were there for a few years. Oh, so few we, years. We, we attended school there, and we also attended school in Alabama. I see. What did you, why, what, what the, why the movement? Well, basically opportunities. So the opportunities for work and for further education. And so all through that time, what were your parents doing? Well, they were working. They were taking care of us, and they were trying to make a, a better life for us. And uh, they did a, a really good job at that, I would say. You say your dad passed. May he rest in peace. What about your mother? My mother is still alive. She lives here in Accra as well. Mm, how old is she now? Well, don't embarrass me by asking me that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be at your fingertips. You just I, I have to do some calculations, oh, and I hate to, to keep people waiting. Oh, I see. All right, interesting. Why are your other uh, brothers uh, and sister? Well, they're all here as well. I have uh, I have an older brother who remains outside the country. Um, his name. My brother. Yeah. You can mention all I, their names. I, I if wouldn't you want, want to put them out like that. Oh, right. so, wow. I see. So so yes, I, I have um, all all of we all moved back together, and uh, two of them actually. One just recently uh, relocated with his wife as well. So.
So that's it. I see you don't really like to talk much about your, your people, your family, yourself. It's a personality profile show, you know, if, well, I, if I, I should remind you. You know, I feel it's unfair <laughs> to, to, you know, put other people's business. If it were me, I could t tell you about It's your business who your brother is. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It, that's right. That's true. But would you want me to tell the world where he is, what he's doing, what his wife is up to? So that's why I'm a little guarded. Mm. I see. You would prefer to talk about leadership and communication. And myself. I can tell you where I live. Okay. <laughs> I live here in Accra. I am married and, and all of that good stuff. Okay, so tell me about your husband. Who's your husband? Well, my husband, uh, who's here in the studio tonight, uh, he uh, started a technology company. And so he's a, he's a techie. Mm -hmm. And uh, they specialize in software. They provide uh, SMS solutions that banks use. He, he uh, does a lot of writing, mm -hmm. especially on the subject as well. So anything computer is his forte. I see. His name is? Charles Hansen Kwao. Charles Hansen Kwao. Mm -hmm. Did you catch him in Ghana or in the US? I caught him in Ghana. <laughs> we caught each other in Ghana. Oh, you caught each other in Ghana. We How many years ago? We caught each other in Ghana. Uh, this year, five years. And what were the circumstances? Under which circumstances yeah. did we catch each other? Well, um, it, it's a funny story, actually, because the first day he met, we, we met, he, he actually, you know, just jokingly said, uh, you know, I love you. You know, it was just a weird circumstance in that sense. And so we were studying, um, we were both working on getting a, a specific degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were in the same institution and that's the situation under which we met. But those words caught your attention. Those words did catch my attention, uh, but not to the point of marriage at the time. But you know, we, we, we had a really strong friendship which blossomed. Great, way led to way, as they say. <laughs> you have children? Not yet. Okay, I see. But I'm sure uh, that's all down the road. Uh, it, 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 it will come down. But really, uh, Yawa, let's get to know a little more about what you do. So at this time, what engages you? When you wake up in the morning, what are you up to? Oh, there's a lot. And it, it seems like there aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, we Leading Ladies Network started in 2009, so we are in our third year. And within this period, we've been able to do a lot of work with women who are enrolled in the polytechnic and university and high school systems. So our work has centered with them on providing career guidance and helping them polish up with the, the soft skills that are needed to succeed in business. Uh, we based our initial you know, work on the on the premise that because of the way most women's lives are centered, at least here in Ghana or across the sub-region, I think our region uh, arguably um, is, is, is one of those regions where tradition to a large extent determines the path that women's lives take. So I think in dealing with issues of empowerment or leadership development for women, we really need to take into consideration the social construct. And so it's been really great for us to have started through research and through um, you know, examining what was out there and what other organizations were doing. And we've kind of carved a, a pretty pretty good niche. So we're at that stage of growth where currently we've developed a leadership curriculum for, for tertiary level students and we're currently piloting that. So we have our first batch of beneficiaries going through that. So it's called the Female Leadership Advancement Mentoring and Empowerment Series. And this is a year long program which brings together the best of personal development um, and leadership skills. And we base our model on what we call servant leadership. That leadership not just, as you said, earlier as a position but as a mandate to serve and so we, we um, that the fruit of that is blossoming we're excited about the outputs of that all of the women who go through the program are also required to give back to the society so there's a social entrepreneurship bit and um, currently we've we've got that all running right, got a picture on the screen polytechnic women's summit uh, can you tell us about this well, this is something we piloted last year with the Polytechnic Women. We've been working with the Women's Commissions, both with uh, the NUGS and the Polytechnic uh, Association. And uh, we, we, we decided that they don't get as much attention when it comes to the issues of empowerment and leadership. And we've been working very closely with them to train more of their women to get involved in student politics, because statistics show that the earlier they get engaged, the more likely down the line that they'll remain engaged. Okay, so this is the same, same occasion, same Polytechnic ladies, which yes, I see. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, 
and this is what Ashesi University. Can you just take us through the pictures as they change? Okay, so yes, Ashesi University. This was the inauguration of the Ashesi uh, campus. I was asked to share a few remarks, and uh, at Berkusu. At Berkusu, the right. beautiful campus in Berkusu. Okay. All right, and you yourself are an alumnus of Ashesi University. I, I am. I have a business degree from Ashesi University. Okay, I see. And then how do you find Ashesi University? Excellent. And I'm not just saying that. I think it's built on a really solid model and uh, a solid vision mm -hmm. for leadership development. And I think Ashesi is, is very connected to my own story of what's led me to this point. At the university, I became the first woman to mm. be president of the student council. Right. And I think that really set me up for this path as well by putting me face to face with what women endure or face when it comes to the political scene. So you stood for an election? I did. Oh, wow. Tell me about the campaign. It was really interesting. I think that, again, I've I, I, I think I've been very blessed in the sense that uh, I was raised in an environment where I was never told I couldn't have anything. Okay. And I was also told that if I had ideas, I had the right to share them. So it's, it's something that I believe really helped me build confidence in, in, in self and then also the ability to, to, to craft solutions. So I campaigned like anyone else campaigned, uh, put together a manifesto based on what I believed I could do. And uh, by, by all of the factors combined, I, I won with an overwhelming majority of the votes. Is national politics on the, uh, on the cards? Well, I, I take my life day by day. I think currently my energies are best spent doing what I'm doing now. We'll take a quick commercial break. If you have some views on our discussion tonight, 1760 is the text line across all networks. It will cost you 30 pesos to send a text. Facebook.com forward slash multi TV PM Express is the Facebook address. Stay with us. We will be right back. In today's challenging world, information technology has become the one-stop option. And Beacon Ghana, an IT solutions and training provider, offers you the requisite training in Microsoft, Cisco, Oracle, Unix, Linux, and many IT courses. The Beacon IT student, after writing the external exams, qualifies with internationally recognized certificates, and job placements and attachments in reputable firms are made available to students who excel. Lectures are in the mornings, afternoons, evenings, and on weekends. Locate Beacon Ghana IT on the second floor, Shamas House, Nansuman Junction, on the Kanishi Odoko Highway. Call plus 233-302-240027 or visit www.beaconghana.com. Beacon Ghana, the IT solutions and training providers. Namibia flies non-stop to Vintuk and beyond in the evenings, six times a week, effective 1st October 2011. Air Namibia, winner of the Feather Awards. We cover Southern Africa extensively. Spend less than one hour in transit through Vintuk to your final destination without a transit visa. Cape Town, Johannesburg, Luanda, Lusaka, Harare, Victoria Falls, Gaborone, Frankfurt, Walvis Bay, Ondangwa, Katima Mililo, Rundu, Orangemont, Luderitz. Locate Air Namibia on the first floor of the Silver Star Towers, Airport City, Accra. Call us on 0302-766-602 or 766-660 or 020-222-0595. Enroll in our frequent flyer program and enjoy discounts on tickets, access to business class lounges, upgrades to business class and excess baggage allowance. Book your flights online, airnamibia.com.na or contact your travel agent. Air Namibia, carrying the spirit of Namibia. Thank you for staying with us. I have Yawa Hansen Kwao, founder of the Leading Ladies Network, in the studio with us. So how does the Leading Ladies Network uh, uh, function? Is it registered as an NGO? Is it, is, that, is it an NGO? Yes, we are registered as an NGO. Okay. So all of our work uh, is, is non-profit. Okay. And uh, we, we offer training. So we do charge just very minimal fees to cover the expense of material and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, most of the work we do with schools, however, is absolutely free. Mm. And we've been working with the, as I said earlier, with the 
the polytechnic women, with the women in the new system, and uh, we're we're excited because it's bearing fruit. As a National Union of Ghana students, National Union okay. of Ghana students, right. with the Women's Commission of these two organizations, okay. and uh, our our work is bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. There are you know the statistics are proving that those women who are going through this very deliberate leadership development and training mm -hmm. are having the guts to, for instance, participate in student politics, are doing better in terms of career choices. And I think that the, the sooner that we engage women in conversations about what their career path may be, the more likely that they will take that into consideration when making other life choices, like who am I going to marry and when will I have children and all of that. I think that the issue of women's leadership becomes delicate because of that, that um, we as women have a social responsibility and, and given to us through the nature of our bodies. So we will bear children at some point or the other, or most, most of us will like to. So it, all of these become a myriad of, 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 of things that have to be examined and looked at when a woman decides whether or not she will run for an office or decide whether she will you know, gun for that promotion in the office. And so our, our work really is to help them weigh all of the odds and uh, to make the best informed choice that they can. Uh, there was a picture on our screens not too, too long ago. Uh, if you can come right back. Um, I see you with, okay, that, that's a picture mm -hmm. right there. Um, what, what was this about? Uh, we were in Bogatanga at uh, the Bogatanga Polytechnic. Mm. And uh, this was a group of women who we had just finished a training session. Uh, I believe our focus, it was a full day event. So I think we did a bit of public speaking and etiquette training. And then um, we also worked with, um, we had, women from all over Africa actually so Mozambique this particular picture shows us teaching them how to develop a professional bio that's from so, Mozambique no this was oh, held in Ghana, in Ghana we okay. had students uh, participants rather from uh, Mozambique and and South Africa and some other places as well so I saw tip three show personality what were you saying well uh, one of the things that we notice with uh, young women who come for interviews for instance is that they show no life in them. So I had the opportunity in my former job uh, to hire and, you know, and one of the things I noticed is that w you could have a young woman come in with a full list of things that she's done on her CV. Mm. And, uh, you know, you're excited to see this person because her CV tells you that she's got relevant information, uh, relevant experience rather, good education and all of that. But she comes before you, sits in front of you and it is shriveled up in the corner of the chair cannot emote cannot look you in the eye and talk to you expand her ideas in a co coherent manner and all of these draw away from her ability to be hired what whereas well, I think it's a number of things. Whereas, on the other hand, a young man with half or nothing or three quarters of what she has comes in, talks his mouth off, and gets the job. And so I think a number of things do account for this. I think it's socialization. I think it's a lack of initiatives such as ours that meet women at the point before they even graduate to start prepping them and teaching them that this is what you will expect, that our world is changing by the second, and the competition is not just local, it's international. And so so to, to expose them early enough in the process so they start practicing. And I often share a story about my own progress as a speaker, for instance. I remember growing up, I was very, very timid uh, at, in certain ways because people used to tease me that I had a really deep voice. And so you know how people are in school, really, really wicked. You raise up your hand to say something and um, you know because of how you sound, and of course, I'm already the girl with a funny name from the funny place and you know so it really affected me and many women have that story and my story was I stopped talking so I stopped talking in class I stopped participating and it even translated into home I felt so self-conscious about what I sounded like that it affected my ability to relate and what helped me was my father stepping in he looked, you know, he noticed that I had grown rather mute and uh, questioned me and prodded until I admitted that indeed I was ashamed of my voice because people were laughing at me. He told me two things that have stuck with me for the rest of my life. He said, number one, don't ever let laughter stop you. And then number two, 
don't let people steal your voice. Your voice is your power. And I think that that's really what started the love relationship that I have had with the concept of voice and finding your true voice and of helping women discover their true potential so that their voices and their contributions can be realized. Very interesting, because uh, I'm sure there are many people out there, many women, who say, I can identify with the first half <clears throat> of what you just said. I can't speak, or I'm a bit too timid, I may be strong intellectually, academically, etc., and all of that, and yet I just cannot bring myself to advance uh, what it is that I am made of. What's your advice to the, that viewer out there? How can she or he mm -hmm. break free? I think it's, it's a number of things. I think, one, you've got to be committed to changing. Um, sometimes you have to get to the point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm. I think, one, recognizing the issue is just half of it, but being committed to solving it, because it does take work. It meant reading. I've been on a 13-year journey uh, for me, and I'm still a member of an international public speaking organization, and I'm still testing myself and still improving. So you've got to be committed to the journey. And I think, secondly, know that you're not alone. There are resources. There are ways to help. And, and, and then thirdly, give yourself to the process. I think it, it can be a painful process because sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Sometimes you have great days where you've, you've said the right thing at the right time. Sometimes it doesn't go as well. But you've got to give yourself to that process. Change, it comes slowly sometimes. Sometimes it comes quickly. But all the thing about this kind of skill is that wherever you are, it's learnable. It is learnable. Some people, yes, I believe, have a natural proclivity to be more vocifer vociferous than others. But I think that anyone who commits to a program of study, who meticulously examines the way that they communicate and looks for their own voice, looks for what works for them, that you, know, you can be as accomplished as, as, you know, as anyone else. Yawa was inducted into the British Council's Pan-African Network of Emerging Leaders. As she's told us, she holds a, a business admin degree from Ashesi University College, honors in entrepreneurship and new product development from the American University of Rome, Italy, a certificate in radio and television presentation from the GIJ right here. And she's also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Community. She serves on the advisory board of the Women's Institute for Global Leadership at Benedictine University. USA, and um, we're asking her what leadership skills she can impart before she leaves. Um, why did you study at the Ghana Institute of Journalism and get a certificate in radio and television presentation? Well, it, it was two things. I was interested in exploring avenues for us to really bring our message of women's leadership and why it's important and why we have to be deliberate and quick about it. Um, I, I was exploring for avenues to do that and I felt that media, engaging media, would be one of those strategic ways to do that. Um, I also felt that the skill of presentation and um, the ability to communicate both on air, on, on radio and TV would be important as someone leading an organization as well. So I, I decided it would be a good investment. I'm sure some are wondering how they can get in touch with you. They're talking about Leading Ladies Network. How does it work? Can anyone just walk into your offices? Do they have to give you a call? They how should can they give benefit? us a call. They can. We do for people who are within uh, the first, typically the first two years of their career, sometimes even beyond. We provide uh, training in presentation skills, for instance, uh, public speaking. We design programs that look at politics more closely, NGO management, and a number of things. So um, we, we have our uh, another public speaking class, for instance, coming up the first week of March. So for people who are interested in that, uh, they can sign up. So they How can go online. Right. Uh, our website is www.leadingladiesnetwork.org. They can call us uh, we, on, on our line. It's 020-637-6427. And um, they can email as well, info at uh, leadingladiesnetwork.org. Dot .org, dot .org. Okay, all right. So that's how they can get in touch with you. I'm reading a few things about you. I find a few interesting things. I don't know where to go. But really... Um, this is the interesting bit uh, that I find someone commenting on you. 
Uh, so speaking English at home, wearing American hairstyles, and playing soccer with her brothers one day, and the next driving four hours with her family to Huntsville to find immigrant farm stands that sold her native foods like palm oil, plantain, and cassava powder. Her family maintained strong ties with Ghana, and Yara grew up amidst the refrain, when is it safe to return? Um, does that bring back memories? It does. A number of memories. I think for anyone who has lived abroad, and not particularly by choice, the longing for home and the inability to, to identify with the environment that you're in. Um, you know, we used to drive for almost five hours to another city to buy gari and palm oil so we could make some yoke gari and feel like we were, you know, at least still back home. Uh, you know, get, you know, the corn, the dough and make some strange banku. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't the same. So yeah, it does bring back a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. And I think also for anyone who's in that situation, there's also this sense, uh, and, and I think, I, I suspect that it may linger with you forever, that you know while you are abroad, you are not 100% native there, mm -hmm. but also when you return, you're constantly reminded of how you are also never 100% native to your home, because you've changed and it has changed. And so there's this sense of, I almost want to call it dis, disengagement. It's, it's like you are a person without a country. But it's positive in the sense that it causes you to transcend. So you are not necessarily Ghanaian, not necessarily American, but you are. You are this global being. And I think that that's actually where the world has gravitated to. If you look at the trends in travel, my background professionally is actually in travel. So when you look at the trends in travel, you'll find this move, a mass exodus of all nations to other nations. And I think that that's, that really enhances the way people perform in work. It enhances the way people perform. And it, it, it increases their ability to dare to be unfamiliar with a place and to thrive and survive in it, I think builds up a confidence in you that you perhaps would never recognize if you stayed home. So I think it has its pros and cons, but definitely it does bring back good memories. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I know that you are obviously from the, from the start and the kind of books that you read, that there's a strong religious dimension to your life. What is the nature of your Christian faith? What is the nature of my faith? I believe that God is in control of my life. And I believe that he has a specific assignment that he expects me to execute. And I believe it's my role as a believer in God to connect in him so I will know that assignment and fulfill it. Have you ever had moments of doubt? I think everyone has moments of doubt. So I am no exception. I have moments where, because sometimes in finding the purpose that God has for you, you wonder because he takes you through the way that you would call the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So I, it, this path of pursuing leading ladies has been full of challenges, uh, full of, you know, I, I've blown life savings, um, lost relationships, uh, had to adapt to a life of less luxury than I would have wanted, you know. Um, I've, I've, you know, a, a, a stint of homelessness. Um, you know, so you will give up a lot to sometimes remain in the will of, of God. And I believe that it can cause doubt if you don't remain under, you know, keep, keep your mind kind of focused on, on your faith. I promise viewers that we'll get you to say a thing or two about leadership generally. What is it about leadership that you think that we should always have at the back of our minds? I think that leadership is not a position. 
I think that that is the key thing. I think that the role of a leader is service and it transforms the way you deal with people and the way, you know, people will now want to be associated with you because they feel like you have their best interest at heart. And I think that, you know, the whole servant leadership as a model, um, this is what we based our own curriculum on. I think it's been proven to be the kind of leadership model that really, really brings out the best in people. So I, I think that leadership as service, and I think that that's just another one of those many reasons why an institution like a Shesi is important because I think within the four years that they uh, that that a student goes through that program we, you're being taught that leadership is service and I think that if we can hear that in more places than just a Shesi or just at leading ladies that that could change a whole paradigm for our next generation we have a few text messages coming in let's let's begin to take them he had a pet Christian young uh, let me ask you before I forget. Do you speak any local language? I do. I speak Tree. Oh, you speak Tree? I speak Tree. I see. But you don't speak ever. My Ewa is not as good as it should be. Mm. But you can still hold a conversation. In it. Well, I tell you this much. I will know when I'm being insulted. Oh, you will know that. I Absolutely. will know. What would you have done if you hadn't done this? If I hadn't done this, I suspect that I would be very, very involved in business. Um, I love the business of travel. And um, it's a passion because I do believe that travel has the capacity to transform people without their permission. Just the, the, the whole concept of leaving a place and engaging in a different place helps you know, transform you and broaden your mind. So I love the travel business and I think that's what I would, I, I would probably be. We have to go, and um, thank you for coming. We wish you all the best in what you're doing. Thank you for having me, it's been yes, a pleasure. We, we trust that you'll be a you continue to be a positive influence your generation to women in particular but of course to our society as generally. God gives me strength.